We turn in sacred scripture to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, and we read verses 19 through 51, where Jesus gathers his first disciples who declare to each other that they have found the Christ. And that's the focus of the preaching this morning, who Jesus is as the Christ. We're going to look at Lord's Day 12 in the Catechism this morning, but first, John chapter 1, beginning at verse 19. And this is the record of John, John the Baptist, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God! which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come, baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Unto whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after, John stood and two of his disciples. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour, 4 p.m. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and the other one, we may presume, was the, the Apostle John writing this. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation, a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee, and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. 
Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So far we read God's holy and infallible word. It's on the basis of this passage of Scripture and on the basis of many passages of Scripture that we have the instruction of Lord's Day 12 of the Heidelberg Catechism, found on page 8 in the back of the Psalter. Lord's Day 12, and we're going to take two uh, sermons to look at this Lord's Day, and this morning we're going to concentrate just on question and answer 31. Why is He called Christ? That is... Anointed, because he is ordained of God the Father and anointed with the Holy Ghost to be our chief prophet and teacher, who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption, and to be our only high priest, who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us and makes continual intercession with the Father for us, and also to be our eternal King, who governs us by His Word and Spirit, and who defends and preserves us in the enjoyment of that salvation He has purchased for us. And so far, then, we look at Lord's Day 12. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, last week's Sunday with Lord's Day 11, we looked at the name Jesus. And what we saw last week was that Lord's Day 11 was foundational for this whole second section of the Apostles' Creed because it emphasizes that Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus exclusively is the one who spans the great distance between who God is as creator and who we are as but creatures of the dust. And Jesus exclusively is the one who spans the great distance between who God is as the one who dwells in heaven, the heavenly realm, and who we are as those who dwell on the earth. And Jesus exclusively is the one who spans the distance between who God is as the holy and righteous God and who we are as guilty sinners. No man comes to the Father but by Jesus. That's what we saw last week. However, there was one thing last week that we did not mention. One thing that is of vital importance. And that is this. In order for Jesus to be our Savior, in order for Jesus to be the way to the Father, Jesus needs to hold the office. He needs to hold the office of the Savior. One thing that God's Word teaches us again and again is that God requires a man to hold office to do the work. You do not have permission. You may not do the work if you don't hold the office. In order for Jesus to lay down his life on the cross and present himself to God as the acceptable sacrifice, Jesus needs to be the one in the office of high priest. 
in order for Jesus to cast out Satan's throne from our hearts and establish his own rule of grace in our hearts. For that work to be accepted by God, Jesus needs to be in the office of king. And in order for Jesus to be able to reveal the glories of God's salvation and the gospel, Jesus needs to be in the office of prophet. If Jesus is not God's office bearer, God's ordained representative, then Jesus does not have the right or the authority to carry out the work that he does as Savior. Well, that's what we're going to look at this morning because Jesus does have that office. That's what the word Christ is referring to. The word Christ, the title Christ, emphasizes that Jesus does have the authority. He has been given the mandate by God himself to do this threefold work of prophet, priest, and king. The word Christ is a title. Jesus, as we saw last week, that is his name, just as my name is Eric. But his title is Christ. That's the title of the office that he holds. He is Jesus the Christ. He is Jesus, the Messiah. And that word Christ simply means anointed one. That word Christ refers to one who has been set apart by God, ordained by God, and equipped by God to hold the office. Namely, in this case, the office of being the Savior of God's people. As the Catechism students know, in the Old Testament, Prophet, priests, and kings were anointed with oil. And that anointing with oil signified that those men were set apart by God and qualified with the Holy Spirit or, and, and equipped with the Holy Spirit to hold that special office, to serve God's people, to serve for their salvation. But as we all know, those offices and, and those men who served in those offices in the Old Testament they were but types and shadows. They weren't doing, we might say, the real work. They weren't doing the real work of actually saving God's people from their sins. But as they did their labors under God, they were constantly pointing the people to the one who would do the work of saving God's people from their sins. And that person to whom they were all constantly appointing, uh, appointing to was the man who we considered last week, Jesus of Nazareth. That's why he's called the Christ. He is the anointed one. That's also why in the scripture reading that we read this morning, what, Peter, what, what Andrew says to his brother Peter is so striking. Maybe it, it stood out to you, the kind of language that these men were using. We have found the Messiah. We have found the Christ. The one who's going to fulfill the promises of God. The one who is the Savior, who's sent, who holds the office to save his people. We have found the one whom God himself has appointed and equipped and sent to do the work of saving us from our sins. And of course, it wasn't just Andrew. This is an announcement that is made over and over again throughout the New Testament. Just think of what the angel says to the shepherds in the fields of Bethlehem, in the middle of the night. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ, Christ the Lord. Think of what Peter says in Matthew 16, his confession. Thou art, he says to Jesus, thou art the Christ. Whom do men say that I am? Whom do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what does Peter say in his Pentecost sermon in Acts 2, verse 36, Peter declares boldly, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, whom God has put in office to do that work of being the way, the truth, and the life, saving God's people from their sins. That's what true faith believes about Jesus of Nazareth. He's not only the exclusive way to the Father, but he is such in part because he is the Christ. That's what we're going to consider in the preaching this morning. We take as our theme, 
we have found the Messiah. We have found the Christ. And then we consider under that theme three things. Who Christ is as our chief prophet and teacher. Who Christ is as our only high priest. And who Christ is as our eternal king. And we're going to see, hopefully through the preaching this morning, we see and appreciate more deeply what these men were saying at the dawn of the New Testament, who Jesus is. Well, in each one of the points in the sermon this morning, we're going to start off by looking at Adam, starting with Adam, and then making our way to Jesus. We start with Adam because Adam himself was created holding a threefold office. Adam himself had the office of prophet, priest, and king under God. You see, Adam was created as God's friend servant, and he was created as God's friend servant in a threefold sense. With his head, Adam knew God rightly. With his head, Adam had a true knowledge of God and served God with that true knowledge. Second, with his heart, Adam was devoted to God. With his heart, he was holy. He was entirely devoted in love to God. And then third, Adam, with his hands, with his strength, he walked in righteousness, walking according to all the commandments of God. With his head, he knew God. With his heart, he was devoted to God. And with his hands, he served God. Or to put it another way, Adam was made in the image of God. True knowledge, true holiness, and true righteousness. Adam had those three components to who he was as a man. His head, his heart, and his hand. His thinking, his affection, and his willing, and his strength. And God created Adam in that way so that Adam might serve as God's office bearer here on the earth in that threefold office. So that using his head, he was a prophet thinking God's thoughts after him and singing his praises and and speaking his praises. As priest, Adam used his heart in devotion to God and then from the heart, pressing all creation into the service of God. And then as king, using his hands, using his strength to serve God. So God created Adam with this office and God equipped Adam with everything needed to carry out that threefold office a prophet, priest, and king. And that's why we start with looking at Adam. First then, let's break it down. Adam was a prophet. He knew God rightly. He spoke God's praises. He had a true knowledge of God. He was filled with upright thoughts of God. That's what man was in covenant relationship with God. He knew God and he walked with God as his friend, servant, and as king of creation. And and God as his friend, king. But as we know, Adam fell into sin. And the consequence of that fall into sin is that Adam lost the image of God. And part of that means that Adam lost the true knowledge of God. Yes, when he fell into sin, he still held an office. And he was still called to hold that office of prophet. He was still called to think rightly about God and to speak and sing his praises. But the dreadful reality was this, instead of being the prophet of God, Adam, having lost the true knowledge of God, brought upon himself darkness of mind and became a servant of sin, a prophet, we might say, of the devil. So that with his head, he turned against the truth. He no longer thought God's thoughts after him. In fact, as a result of his fall into sin, Adam shut off his mind towards the truth. So that after the fall into sin, all man can do by nature is speak the lie. Remember how Romans 3 puts it. His throat has become an open sepulcher. His, his mouth, his, with his tongue he uses deceit. The poison of asps, the poison of snakes is under his lips. His mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. As the Belgic Confession says, all the light which is in us is changed into darkness So that although man boasts that he knows very much and that he's wise, the reality is he is in truth full of ignorance. By nature he's a fool and shrouded in darkness, groping in the dark. And the result is that Adam and mankind needs to be saved. 
He needs to be saved, first of all, from this point of view. He needs to have his mind renewed. He needs to have his mind illuminated by the Holy Spirit that he might rightly understand God and discern things of the Spirit of God. He needs to have the light of God's wisdom penetrate his darkened mind. And that's why, throughout the Old Testament, God sent prophets. So that by these prophets, God's people might be restored to a right understanding of God. And so that by these prophets, God's people might know the truth of who God is and the good news that God had prepared for His people in Jesus Christ. Now, God Himself was the first one to speak, to, to, to prophesy, you might say. Right away there in Genesis 3, in the very same chapter in which Adam and Eve sinned, God comes to them with that covenant promise. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed, Satan, and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's the mother promise. That was God himself first speaking his word. But then throughout the Old Testament, God sent his prophets to keep bringing that same word and expanding on it. And God sent many prophets. And to go no further, let's go to John chapter 1. Think of John the Baptist the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And what was the calling and function of the prophet John? To bear witness to the light, to prepare the way for the Savior. And the point that I want to emphasize now is this, the calling and function of the prophets in the Old Testament was to be a light in the midst of a dark world, to reveal the truth of the gospel to God's people so that God's people might have a knowledge of the truth and through the work of the Holy Spirit, come to a right knowledge of God and, and a, a spiritual knowledge of God. They were sent to serve, to serve for the salvation of God's people. And we could, we could say, in a sense, the prophets were sent to restore God's people to God's image. In this sense, that they might have their minds illuminated and have a true knowledge of God. But now we know, as you work through the Old Testament, those Old Testament prophets were types. As they spoke the truth of God to God's people, they were never themselves the one who, who could actually restore God's people to that saving knowledge of God. Only, only the great prophet and teacher could do that, the Christ. That's Jesus. That's who Jesus is. That's, that's the, the joy of God's people as he arrives on the scene at the beginning of the New Testament. This is the Christ, our chief prophet and teacher. And just as the, the, the office bearers in the Old Testament were anointed with oil, so Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit. We read that in John chapter 1. That's the significance of Jesus being anointed with the Holy Spirit. That's when he is equipped for his ministry. This is Jesus entering formally into the work of his office. For 30 years he has been the Christ, but now he enters into that office to be the Christ. And the Holy Spirit is poured out upon him. And he's set apart by God and he's anointed, equipped with the Spirit to do the work. And what does he immediately start doing? He immediately begins preaching. He immediately begins revealing to God's people the secret counsel and will of God concerning their redemption. And Jesus is a prophet in an altogether unique way because he's not only one who speaks the word of God, but as the Apostle John emphasizes earlier in the chapter, he is the word of God. And in all his life, in all his work, he is proclaiming the love of the Father to his people. That comes out especially in his work on the cross. Even with his hands nailed to the cross, he is still proclaiming, still prophesying, still declaring to God's people, this is how much God loves you. He has sent me, his only begotten son, to die in your place and bear your punishment that you might not perish but have everlasting life. That was Jesus. His whole life is carrying out the work of, of prophet. And he's not just the one who speaks the word of God, but he is the one who also can and who does open up the hearts of God's people and enters into their hearts and softens those hearts 
And he enters into the minds of God's people and he illuminates their minds so that they receive and they truly embrace by faith the word of God. He is the prophet like no other because he's the one who causes us to see and know God spiritually. He is the one who restores us to the image of God in this way. He restores to us the true knowledge of God. He takes away my ignorance. He takes away my blindness. He opens my eyes. He illuminates my mind and he fills me with himself, with his own light so that I begin to think God's thoughts after him and I rightly know God and I do begin to speak and sing his praises. What Adam did through the fall into sin, Jesus undoes through his work as the second Adam, as prophet. And this is exactly why God ordained Jesus to this office, that he might save his people from their sins. Well, in John chapter 1, we see that aspect of Jesus on display, perhaps in numerous ways you can see it, but notice verses 38 and 39 of John chapter 1. Andrew and John start following Jesus. Jesus says, what are you seeking? And they respond to his question with their own question, where are you staying? Clearly, they want to spend time with Jesus. And in verse 39, Jesus shows them where he's staying. He spends the day with them. And what happens? Well, after spending the day with Jesus, Andrew rushes off to find his brother Peter because he knows, just based on Jesus' conversation with him, he knows that Jesus is the Christ. We have found the Messiah. Just based on how Jesus was speaking to him. Of course, it's the same thing with Nathaniel at the end of the chapter. Jesus, as prophet, speaks so that, so that we know from his voice that he is the prophet of God. This is the prophet, the prophet of whom Moses spoke. Jesus is our chief prophet and teacher. And our calling as we confess him as the Christ, as our Christ, our calling is to hear him and to listen to him. Well, that is who Jesus is as our chief prophet and teacher. But not only is he our chief prophet and teacher, he is also our only high priest. And let's do the same thing as what we've done. We want to see who Jesus is as the fulfillment of the scriptures. And we want to see the excitement of these uh, believers at the dawn of the New Testament, they were looking for this one, the second Adam, and now here he comes before them. So again, we start with Adam. Adam was not only created as a prophet, but Adam was created also a priest. And as a priest, his heart was devoted to God, and he was called to serve God in holiness with his whole being, his aim was to bring God glory and honor. And that's what a priest does. A priest is one who is entirely set apart, entirely devoted to the worship of the Lord in all that he does. And that's what Adam was supposed to do, even with, with all the creation that was under him. As priest, take it and bring it as a sacrifice of praise to the Lord. In the Old Testament, that's why the priests in the Old Testament weren't even given any land, because they weren't supposed to be distracted by the land. The Lord is your portion, and your calling is to be wholly consecrated to the Lord. That's the office of priest. But as we know, Adam fell into sin, and the consequence of that fall into sin is that Adam lost that devotion to the Lord, and instead he brought upon himself the opposite. Instead of being devoted to God, Adam now starts pressing himself into the service of sin and Satan. Instead of using all things for the glory of God, Adam now begins pressing all things into the service of the glory of man. And that's not just Adam, but that's the whole human race under Adam. So that man becomes spiritually unclean, impure. Everything he touches becomes unclean. So that we're not just full of ignorance and blindness with our minds darkened, but we've corrupted our whole nature and we've become impure in all our affections. I believe that's the language of the canons of Dort. We are guilty. And because of our sins, because of our uncleanness, we're not even worthy to appear in the presence of God. 
And the result is that Adam and mankind need salvation. He needs to be saved. Also now from this point of view, not just having his mind delivered from its darkness, but having his heart delivered from being captivated to sin. He needs to be delivered from the, the hatred and enmity towards God that dwells in his heart. He needs to be delivered from devotion to sin. He needs to be devoted to God once again. And that's why in the Old Testament, God sent his people priests. He sent his people priests so that by these priests, the people might be once again devoted to God. That's really what a priest's function was. He devoted the people to God. He devoted them to God. He brought them to God. That's really what he was doing. There were three main things that a priest did in the Old Testament. He would, he would take the sacrifice, the animal, from the person making the sacrifice, and he would, he would make the sacrifice on behalf of the person. And through that sacrifice, the sins of the people were covered. So that through the priest, the, the people could be received back into God's fellowship. Second, not only did he make the sacrifice, but then he went into the temple and he sprinkled and he, he went and twice a day uh, burn on the altar of incense and, and once a year, the high priest, right? Going into the most holy place, sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. And that was a picture of, of going to God on behalf of the people even burning the, the sweet-smelling incense, that rising up to heaven. That was a picture of God's people and their prayers going to God as a sweet-smelling savor. And then third, the priest would come back out of the temple, he would lift his hands, and he would bless the people. He would pronounce upon them God's blessing. And there they would have fellowship with God through the priest, the priest devoting them to God and bringing them into that fellowship with God. Well, of course, God himself was the first one to, to act this way, to bring his own people into fellowship with him. Think about that, the very same chapter, Genesis chapter 3. Remember what God does. He slays the animals, and he covers Adam and Eve with the animal skins, teaching his people right away that it's through the shedding of blood that their sins would be covered, but then also teaching them right away that he would make the sacrifice and he would make sure that their sins would be covered so that they can continue to have fellowship with him. The daily sacrifices at the temple, all the blood every day at the temple, emphasize to the people, this is how you have fellowship with God. So, so God was the first to act on behalf of his people, but then God also sent priests to, to do that work on his behalf, under him. But then with all those priests and all the work that they did and the sacrifices, the people also learned throughout the Old Testament that these things were inadequate. Even the priests themselves were inadequate. Even the priest himself had to make a sacrifice for his own sin. Every morning, every evening, another lamb was offered at the temple, emphasizing to the people that there is no end. There, there still needs to be made a sacrifice for sin. The blood of bulls and goats does not make satisfaction for sin. And so it was all teaching the people in the Old Testament, these things are but types and shadows. Keep looking ahead to the high priest, the Christ, the anointed one, who will do the work and finish the work. So the point was to teach the people to look ahead, to look ahead to what Psalm 110 was speaking about, the priest who's not after the order of Aaron, but the priest who's after the order of Melchizedek. That's the Christ. And as the catechism says, that's Jesus. As the scripture says, as these believers in the New Testament say, that's Jesus of Nazareth. He is the high priest. As the book of Hebrews emphasizes, Jesus is that better high priest. He's the one who goes past the curtain into the most holy place, into heaven itself on behalf of his people. He, he's the high priest whose heart is perfectly devoted to the Lord in love. Jesus is the one who doesn't have to make a sacrifice on behalf of himself because he had no sin. And he is the high priest who will never die, who will never fall out of his office. He is 
the Christ. As the high priest, as the perfect high priest of his people, Jesus is the one who makes the complete payment, once and for all, laying down his life on the cross. The sacrifice that we could never bring, the sacrifice that was his own life, and he laid it down freely on behalf of his people. And then not only does he make the sacrifice, not only does he go into the temple and make intercession, but then he also comes out from heaven and he pours out his blessing upon his people as Pentecost takes place. He pours out his Holy Spirit upon his people as the high priest of his church. And in addition to that, what is so beautiful and precious about Jesus as high priest is that Jesus doesn't just do the work of the high priest outside of us, but Jesus is the one who's able to enter into our own hearts. And he's the one who's able to turn our own hearts from devotion to sin and turns them unto devotion to God. Jesus is the high priest like no other because he's the one who actually devotes us to God in the very center of our being. He's the one who restores us to the image of God in this sense, not just now having our minds illuminated, but now having our hearts changed, taking out that heart of stone that's devoted to sin and giving me a soft heart, a heart of flesh. He's the one who purifies us. He's the one who makes us clean in the sight of God. He does that not only legally through his shedding of his blood on the cross, but he does that by the work of his spirit working in us, sanctifying us. So what Adam did through his fall into sin as the first Adam, you might say as the first office bearer, Jesus now undoes through his work as the second Adam, as the Christ. And this is exactly why God ordained Jesus and sent him, that he might save his people from their sin. In John chapter 1, we see this aspect of Jesus as the Christ also in the scripture reading. Notice just how John the Baptist refers to Jesus. John chapter 1, verse 36, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He is the sacrifice and he's the high priest. Verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He's both the priest and the sacrifice. And although it might be questionable how much Andrew and John understood of these words, no doubt when John the Baptist pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God, Andrew and John did understand that their own teacher, John the Baptist, was pointing out that this man is the Christ. I'm not the Christ. He's the Christ. I am the one who's not even worthy to unloose his sandal. He is the Christ. So then Andrew goes to his brother Peter and says, we have found the Christ. This is the one whom God has appointed, whom the church throughout the ages has been looking for. Jesus is our only high priest. He is our Christ. I confess him as my Christ and my calling, and our calling is to put our trust in him alone and to keep looking to his sacrifice alone for our whole salvation, continue praying to God through his name, and to continue to look to God through him for his blessing. Well, not only is Jesus our chief prophet and teacher, not only is he our only high priest, but he is also our eternal king. This is who he is as the Christ. And we can do the same thing with that office as well. Again, we start with Adam. Adam was not only created as prophet, not only as priest, but also as king. And as king under God, Adam's calling was to rule over creation and, and subdue the earth and press everything into the service of God's glory. With his hand, with his strength, with his will, Adam was called to have dominion, right? Name the animals. And then his calling also as king was to protect, to protect the creation, to protect the earth from sin. That's what a king is. A king is one who's given the authority from God to rule. He's given the power to rule. He's equipped with that. And then he's also called to rule on behalf of God. But Adam fell into sin. And the consequence of that is that Adam no longer was serving God as king, but Adam, in his fallen sinful nature, became rebellious as king. 
He lost all righteousness. He lost using his hands in the service of God. And now as king, he starts using his hands and his strength in the service of sin. So he not only lost the true knowledge of God, he not only lost a true holiness, but now he loses a true righteousness, doing what is right in God's eyes. He became a king in the service of the devil, really, in the service of the kingdom of darkness. And now, as king, he strives to assert his own will and establish his own kingdom, where his own name is glorified rather than God's. And the result is that Adam, in that condition, is miserable and needs to be saved. Mankind needs salvation from that. And and he needs to be saved now also from this point of view. Not just being delivered from the darkness of mind, not just being freed from devotion to sin, but now delivered from the tyrannical rule of the devil. He needs to have God's word etched on the tablet of his heart once again. He needs to be given a will that is now good and obedient and pliable, pliable, a will that is actuated and strengthened so that once again, by God's grace, he is walking in the paths of righteousness and he is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what he needs to be saved unto. And that's why in the Old Testament, God sent kings. He's teaching them about their need for salvation, their need for a king. Some of the catechism students have actually just been looking at the judges recently, the the Judge Gideon, right? And, And why did God send them judges? Because they needed deliverance. Because they had gone their own way. Everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. There was no king in Israel. There was no king to rule them. There was no king to subdue their rebellious hearts. By nature, they were a lawless people. And so God gave them kings to serve their salvation. Through the king, righteousness was promoted Evil was suppressed. Enemy nations were subdued and God's people were protected and cared for. That's when they had a good godly king. How important it is to have a godly king. And that's also demonstrated when you see a wicked king ascending the throne and the whole nation is brought once again into misery and turmoil. But that's why God sent kings to his Old Testament people to serve their salvation and then also to teach them to keep looking forward. Because every king that they had was imperfect. Every king that they had fell into sin. They needed the one who was perfect. Those Old Testament kings were types pointing ahead to the Christ, the anointed king, the anointed one, Jesus, who is our eternal king. Jesus is the one who rules us and governs us by his word and spirit, who defends and preserves us in the enjoyment of that salvation that he has purchased for us. On the, on the cross, Jesus, as the king of his people, fought for his people, and he crushed the head of their enemy, the devil. Through his suffering and his death and his resurrection, Jesus, as king, transformed the grave and death so that these things are no longer a passageway for God's people to hell but they are now a passageway for God's people to glory. And Jesus is the marvelous king because he also enters into our hearts. He casts off the throne of Satan from our hearts and he establishes his own reign of grace in our hearts. He leads us and directs us by his word and spirit and he defends us and preserves us in this salvation. So Jesus is the one who restores fallen man back into the image of God now in this regard. He restores me so that I start walking the paths of righteousness again. I can, with my hands, press the things that God has given me into the service of his name. Ruling over my body, ruling over my soul, ruling over what God has put me over so that it's in service to him, the great king. Not only am I legally righteous in Christ through the righteousness of my king, but he, by his sweet influence, makes me to walk the path of righteousness more and more so that I live according to God's commandments joyfully more and more. In John chapter 1, we see this aspect of Jesus as the Messiah also come off the pages. At the very end of the chapter, Nathanael makes that beautiful confession, thou art the king of Israel. 
Now, when you think about when Nathaniel says that, what's he saying? You are the king. What Nathaniel there is saying is the same thing that, that Andrew said earlier. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one that we are looking for. That's, that's John chapter 1. That's, it's striking. He's the word made flesh. Let's know him as God come in the flesh, the son of God. That's how John begins his gospel. And then also, this in John chapter 1, he is the Christ. Let's get right to it. This is who Jesus of Nazareth is, the one in whom we are to place all our trust and confidence. Jesus is our prophet, our priest, and our king. And as our king, we confess him as, my, as our Christ. He's our king, and our calling is to submit to his will and follow his commandments. And so, we see this morning how these two names work with each other. Jesus and Christ, they go so perfectly together. Jesus is his name. Jesus means Savior. He's the only way to the Father. And he is the way to the Father because he is the Christ. He's the office bearer of God, the anointed one. The threefold office of Adam, which Adam um, ruined and, and which was brought into sin, into the service of sin, now that's undone through the threefold work of the second Adam. We lost the image of God in the first Adam, and it's through Christ that we are restored to that image again. Jesus is the one who's our chief prophet and teacher. He imparts to us, once again, the true knowledge of God. Jesus, as our only high priest, is the one who sweetly works in us so that our hearts are devoted to God. And Jesus is the one who by his spirit, as our Christ, works in us so that our hands are now laboring in the service of the king. This is how Jesus is the second Adam. This is how Jesus is a complete savior. He saves us through the work that he does in his office. This is how God delivers his people from their sins. This is what true faith believes. This is what faith clings to. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, who we know is not the biological son of Joseph, the son of Mary, the son of God, he is the Christ. We have found the Messiah, right? Think about that. How many people today are actually looking for a Messiah? You look at the religions of the world, look at the Jews, Look at many others. They are looking for their own Messiah, looking for their own Savior. Beloved, you and I have found the Messiah, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. The question that I leave you with is this. This is our joy. This is our comfort. Jesus is the Christ. He's my Christ. But if we confess Jesus to be our chief prophet and teacher, are we listening to his word accordingly? Is he my teacher? Is he your teacher? If we confess Jesus to be our only high priest and we're trusting in him for the, are we then? Are we then trusting in him for the once for all sacrifice he has offered on the cross? Am I looking to him as my priest, my comforter, my merciful and faithful high priest? If we confess to Jesus, if we confess Jesus to be our eternal king, then in my life am I also submitting myself under his rule, doing his will and pleasure? Is he the one that you are living unto? This is the joy of confessing Jesus as the Christ. This is also the reality that is ours, knowing that he is our Christ. We love him, we serve him. We, we learn from him, we look to him alone as our Savior. May God grant it more and more. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, it is good to see afresh what it means that Jesus is the Christ. And may we appropriate all this instruction to ourselves and see Jesus as our Christ. And may we rejoice in it. And may we also uh, be made sober by it as we know the great calling 
that is ours in it, to look to him alone. Strengthen our faith, Lord. We thank thee for the faith of these believers early in the New Testament who were going to be the disciples and apostles of Jesus. And we thank thee that we have that same faith that thou hast given to them. We have found the Messiah. Strengthen us through this preaching. Shape our hearts and our lives by it. For it is in Jesus, the Christ, that we pray. Amen.